Well, it's hard to be so short and pithy, so I'm a little um, more cheery. But I mean, as you all know, Suzanne was smart, kind, loyal, careful, precise, articulate, and thorough, and I miss her. Um, on a recent vacation that our family took to Switzerland, I thought of her as we walked along this wooden bridge in Rappersville, which is part of an old pilgrimage path from Santiago de Compostela, and I imagined it being the kind of place she would have enjoyed. Um, also, just yesterday, as I sat in the audience at Hertz Hall on the Berkeley campus listening to Joel, my husband, singing classical Russian music with the Berkeley Community Chorus, I also thought of how she would have appreciated being there, and she did join us at um, some of the concerts in which he participated. Um, we first met when I was in sixth grade and she was in seventh grade. She lived down the block. I don't recall exactly how it happened, but we bonded very quickly over a love of quirky and eclectic, specifically Nancy Drew books. <laughs> um, and also what was either an ignorance or lack of interest in popular culture of the day. And I felt honored that an older girl was interested in me. She was in middle school and I was still in elementary school. So, our tea party tradition began in high school prompted by an old etiquette book that I found at a flea market which said that this was the sort of thing young ladies should do. We were three sets of sisters, me and my sister Nancy, Rowan, who was my age, who I had met when I was in second grade, and her sister Paula, who was in kindergarten with Nancy, because in those days, Dr. Spock said you should have your children a year and a half apart, and everybody we knew had their, their kids were all a year and a half apart. There was like one go-to child book. And then Susanna Marlies, who were also the same age spread, and, but they, so they were each a year older, Susanna a year older than me, and then Marlies a year older than Nancy and um, Paula. We dressed up, made tea sandwiches and cookies and chatted and gossiped, one successful tea party led to others, and the tradition continued on and off over the years. It was our own nerdy crowd before that word had any cachet. Um, we supported each other through our ups and downs, studies, work, relationships, births, illnesses, deaths. Suzanne had a special and unique relationship with each of us. She was always there for us, opinionated with a slow, methodical, articulate way of talking and a willingness to listen. While in high school, we Tea Party sisters also went folk dancing together at Stanford University. It was there that Suzanne developed a love of folk dancing, enjoyed crushes on cute college guys, and grew more interested, I think, in diverse cultures and languages. I don't recall going that much, but she and Paula really bonded a lot over that. And, um, and according to Paula, she um, I guess worked on her, eth her, her, her singing as well, her ethnic folk singing. Um, Suzanne started college at UC San Santa Barbara, but after a year transferred to UC Berkeley, which was a better fit for her culturally. And she majored, I think, in anthropology and linguistics, or and, um, and she enjoyed studying Latin, Serbo Croatian, and Hebrew, among other languages. I don't even know what else she got into. She, and she already, as you guys, she already knew French. Um, I remember I would visit, I was at UC Santa Cruz at the time, and I would visit her in her house, which was very diverse, and, um, and I met, and one of her housemates was Indian, and I still own the cookbook that he recommended. It's a good one. Um, after graduating, she moved down to Southern California near Marlies to study fashion merchandising and got a marketing internship. But if you know Suzanne and you think about it, that turned out not to be a good fit for her personality and skills. They really wanted her to go out there and schmooze people up and get convinced them to buy things that they didn't need. And, you know, that wasn't going to fly. So she worked on teaching herself programming, supported by her dad, who had done the same thing. Um, he was a high school French teacher who had learned programming and then got a job in the field. And through her hard work and perseverance, she was able to move into that field. And that was... Early on, that was before, that was right around the transition, to, I think, before personal computers were a big thing. Um, I, re I remember her returning to Berkeley from Southern California. She took over the apartment I'd been living in during grad school, which was on Oxford Street. And for a while, she worked in the furniture department at Mervyn's, um, which she found quite tedious. But she was a responsible employee in spite of many frustrations. Um, and. I remember over the years she would talk about how worn out she would get at work, and I sort of wonder, like thinking back in retrospect, it's like, was that the cancer sort of nibbling away at her insides? I don't know. 
I mean, eventually she landed that great job at Schwab, and I mean, you know, there were ups and downs, I think, with her relationship with, with um, some of the supervisors, but, um, <laughs> but, but, um, but, it, but on the whole, she, I think she found the work interesting, and she cultivated many interests, as you know, she was an incredible knitter, she was also an amazing and exacting seamstress, she was so thorough and careful with everything she did. I, she was my go-to person when I had to make uh, my daughter's bat mitzvah dresses, which was a real challenge as it, they wanted fitted dresses for bodies that were in transition and they wanted it out of silk fabric. So I really needed her help. Um, I also remember her showing me lace. She, was, she knitted lace. I mean, you can imagine how detailed and tiny that is. And then, of course, we know about her sweaters. Um, she joined me in, with my family for Shabbat dinners and even learned some of the blessings. So, you know, she, she was very ecumenical and liked, all, liked religious practice, found that interesting. And I know she joined a local Episcopal church in, in Berkeley. I don't exactly know exactly when and sang in the choir for a number of years. And she enjoyed the community she met that way. Um, and she and Marlise shared a love of gardening, which is by, why both of them wanted houses with gardens. And I remember their delight in buying and planting their roses. And she even installed this small water element in her backyard. I was really impressed. Um, she was a knowledgeable bird watcher, and there are still bird feeders in her backyard. She volunteered for public radio drives. And, I mean, she wa constantly wanted to give back. I mean, even, even when she wasn't as capable towards the end, she was like transcribing these odd documents online because she couldn't get out of the house, but so she wanted to do something. It was like they sent her stuff that was in French that was handwritten and she would transcribe it so that it could be used by researchers. And she said, apparently this is this, she heard about it and was interested and you would like bid on projects. So they put them out there and she said, I guess there was one that she didn't quite get. It was like um, some famous comedians um, hand notes or something. And so, I mean, I was really impressed. Of course, she knew about, you know, about the cats. Um, I remember her family's Siamese cats that, that um, she grew up with. They have, I guess, very strong personalities. Um, I, and I guess I, she, I remember her telling me that Siamese have, have more intense personalities than most kind of cats. Um, and having her own house meant she could have her own cats. So she did until the, until the last one died. Um, and then she fostered cats when she felt that she didn't, the time she had left would not be enough um, for her to be a responsible cat owner, which seemed like a really, such a kind compromise. As you all heard, she enjoyed traveling and took quite a number of trips to the UK where she went with rambling groups. Um, and became, she was quite an Anglophile. I don't know whether like the tea party prompted that, you know, love of tea and all those kind of things, but, um, but I think that also, you know, and the Doctor Who stuff, but it all, but I also think she had a bit of a stiff upper lip kind of attitude when it came to emotional challenges. You know, just tough it up. Um, she supported Marlise in dealing with Marlise's um, depression, but did not dwell on it, at least not in conversations with me. And I know Marlise's death hit her really hard because she told me that she'd been hoping that they would grow old together. Um, and the death of her cats was another serious blow that came not long after, though I don't recall the exact timing. I think that was... It was really hard to lose all those companions. Um, as you know, she never married, though she had some several serious long-term relationships. I never met those boyfriends, but I heard about them. One was in college, and then another one, maybe some of the Schwab people know, was a contractor she met at Schwab. And I know the latter had a home and a daughter in the East Coast, and they spent many long weekends flying to meet somewhere in between. Um, in the end, neither was willing to move to be together. And um, I don't recall, I don't, I don't know the specifics about why, you know, all the breakup, but I can't believe the cancer got her. She was so careful and thorough when doing her research, and she took really good care of her health. When she received the diagnosis that it wasn't pneumonia, but third stage lung cancer, she did everything she could to plan for her end so that her family wouldn't have to go through what she went through with dealing with Marlise's estate. She was really methodical and careful. She had so many different kinds of cancer for the years, I'm not even sure I know the full litany. I visited her once when um, one of the nursing staff came by to like take her blood or something and, the, and that person was like, how many of how many, you've had Hodgkin's skin cancer, breast cancer, I think the ovarian is in there, then lung and brain. I mean, it was like, what organ was she missing, you know, that didn't get cancer? Um, despite, despite all the time she spent being treated, she didn't wallow in it or obsess about her health. She wasn't, she, 
When I visited with her, she gave me the updates, but was happy to talk about all, a lot of other subjects. Um, she thought that perhaps the treatment she'd received for the Hodgkins, which she got in college, might have caused the other kinds of cancer. But she's not sure, because it was pretty intense, like radiation and chemo. And you know, in those days, things were done in big doses, not, not as refined. And I mean, I guess you know, what she, the treatment she got for the lung cancer was very targeted just to the kind she had and not to, you know, it was very personalized. And they've got, this is, well, but we'll never know. Nancy helped organize a number of tea parties that last year of her life. Um, we hadn't had one in quite some time, and so Suzanne became our excuse for more wonderful gatherings to eat dim sum and chat. Even when Suzanne was in the hospital, Nancy made sure to have some dim sum on hand to tempt Suzanne. And Rowan sewed a quilt covered in cats to keep her warm, and, um, and Paula drove three hours each way to be at her side. Um, to me, she was a model of compassion, friendship, and perseverance. She was loyal and took pride in that. I recall her telling me that while she didn't have many friends, she had solid friends. Um, Suzanne, I miss you and will always remember you. I think she saw me for who I was and accepted me. Thank you. <laughs>